Yes, hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. I've got a very special interview for you all today with Matt Hodgson, who is the showrunner on a mission to Burnley and the co-founder of Ad Hoc Films, obviously the production company behind Mission to Burnley. And before we get into it, I just want to say a massive thank you to Matt because I actually recorded this last week while he was on holiday with his family and he couldn't have been more accommodating. Like He kept sending me times and dates and I was actually pushing him back saying, oh, I can't do that day, mate, I'm in work. And he just kept sending more. And like I said, he was on holiday with the family. So I really do appreciate him finding the time. I've got a lot of time for Matt. He's a, he's a really nice guy. Uh, but yeah, in this interview, me and Matt speak about you know a wide range of things on the show. We talk about the clip that went viral between Johan Berg, Gubnerson and Vincent Company. Uh, the other clip between Jack Cork and Lyle Foster, where them two start having an argument in the changing room after a defeat. Uh, that one didn't really go as viral, but it's still a massive part if you'd have seen the documentary in the show um, and again some other bits as well it's interesting i speak to matt as well about how ad hoc films sort of like maintain a good relationship with the club because there's been a couple of times where there may or may not have been like a tap on the shoulders to say like to the camera people that like, should you really be recording this bit and it's interesting to hear his perspective on how his like i said camera people and, and the people working on the show maintain a good relationship with the club despite you know being involved in such a volatile environment like it was last year uh, but yeah let's get into it and, and obviously there's going to be a lot of spoilers in here i've already given you some so if you haven't watched it yet and you don't want some spoilers it's probably best to watch this interview after you've seen the show but yeah like i said let's get into it how you doing mate yeah i'm good thank you i'm i'm, I'm on holiday at the moment so i can't complain yeah, I know. I just want to say a big thank you for coming on the show. Obviously, when when you are on holiday, I understand it's obviously been difficult to squeeze it in with you being, I think, six hours behind our time as well and things like that. And obviously, you being away. So honestly, mate, I really do appreciate it. So thank you for coming on and, and having this this chat with us, mate. I really do appreciate it. No problem. Um, first of all, obviously, it's been about a week now since season two of Mission to Burnley has come out. I'm not sure if you've seen it, obviously, with you being away, but the reaction has been quite good over here in Burnley. Everyone seems to like the season. Uh, a lot of people saying it's 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 better than the first. What are your thoughts on on it going down? Well, obviously, I'm sure you'll be be happy with that. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's inevitable on a on a project such as this that the foundations are laid in season one. You know, you you your your only goal should be to improve on that. So I'm I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. You know, I've still got a lot of affection for season one, but, um, you know, with season two, I think you're starting to see the sort of the seeds that we planted from an access point of view really bear fruit. And these things take a, a hell of a long time, you know, and if you go in and smash and grab in the first season, you don't get a second season. So it was always our intention to maintain an upward trajectory on relationship and, and, and uh, access. And like I say, I think that's sort of born fruit in season two. I think it's it's a more sort of complex and, and layered story, isn't it, in season two? And, and it's because we've just got our cameras in more places and, and with more volume of footage as well. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's gone down better than season one then? You mentioned access there. Do you think that that's the main, the main thing, the main reason why it's gone down so well? Because you obviously see a lot more, but there's obviously a lot of jeopardy in it as well with the relegation and, and everything going wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that definitely the access um you know is is a huge component of that but i think also the premier league as well you know i mean it's just it just sort of amps everything up doesn't it uh the fact that burnley were in the, the biggest league and uh everybody sort of knows the story a bit more acutely either consciously or subconsciously because of the way that the, the premier league is sort of spoon fed to us relentlessly so yeah. I think that, that that has helped um the sort of the understanding from the audience's point of view and they've enjoyed enjoyed it more than that. Um but you know, I think in season one there were points when we were struggling to get access and it probably showed every now and again. Uh, but season two we didn't have that issue. And you know, when it came to the edit, it was so jam-packed, it was very difficult to to know what to 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 omit, you know, rather than keep in, in some instances. Yeah, why do you get more access in this one? Is it just because you've got a better relationship with Alan and a better relationship with the club now? Yeah, I think people were just more used to having the cameras there on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I think trust has to be earned. So, you know, we understood that in the first season, that where we would sort of 
be um, more of a scenario where we were sort of in and then out and in and then out because um, I think that sort of having a blanket kind of coverage would have made people uneasy at that point. So you, you just build up to that. And it's always really important to me to maintain those relationships. Um, you know, you do hear horror stories of some productions where they just go in and smash and grab. And it's not really the way I've ever wanted to do it because not just with Burnley, but you want your reputation as filmmaker and that filmmakers as a, as a production company to sort of go on to other product projects and other football clubs need to sort of understand that the way you operate is is in the right manner so those relationships were always really key and um yeah like i say i think that's that's what occurred in season two yeah just sticking with sort of like the operation then like how much access do you actually have then because obviously the shots of you in the dressing room the shots that you uh, of you guys that, that you've taken at the training ground are you genuinely there now pretty much day to day five six seven days a week are you pretty much there all the time with the cameras rolling well um <clears throat> in season two yes uh there's always occasions when you have to be smart yeah uh, about just how much you're, you're sort of showing your face and your presence we had two guys uh who are based up north who would go into training most days, James and Adam. And, you know, the key to that isn't the, the amount of time that they're in there. It's the way that they they manoeuvre when they're in there. So it sounds like, oh, if you go in every day, then that's, that's quite sort of um, overwhelming. But it might just be that they go and do 30, 40 minutes in a day, but that's where they get the really mm. good stuff. And then they allow everybody to breathe. So it's very much a sort of hearts and minds exercise sometimes and, and reading people and understanding that people need space as well. Um, but yeah, they, they were there most days. And then obviously every single match day, we did every single match day this last season, you know, including Salford away. Uh, in the, you know what I mean? So so from a match day point of view, we were always there. There were occasions when it, it, it wasn't possible to get in dressing rooms at some matches, particularly away, away games. It's complicated. Um, but, you know, if you're doing that amount of games, you're not going to miss the odd one here or there. Um, and then obviously you've got the other side, the operational side of the club, where we would um, we wouldn't be in the club every single day because again it's James and Adam who are having to kind of dovetail or you know uh, sort of divide their time between the training ground and, and, and turf more with the offices. So we would we would sort of try and get an understanding of what is going on, what key meetings might be occurring, and then try and sort of jump in on those when when we had the time away from the training ground. Yeah, from a production side, though, it must be quite... Like, I know you've already said already that it's, it's difficult to understand what to keep and what to omit and, and that sort of thing. But when you've got, like you said, the operational side of the club as well on top of the playing side, so you, obviously you've got shots in there from sort of like the scouting meetings, which, which really good insight for me as a fan. I, I, I wasn't aware that that's kind of like the, of the way scouting is done now, just predominantly... Mm -hmm through analytics and stuff. I'd obviously heard this, but to actually see it done. And then you've got obviously the transfer meetings with um, the COO and stuff like that. So you must have a lot of stuff that just, like you said, just gets omitted. It must be very difficult to, to decide on, on what you're actually going to keep in. So how, how do you decide? You must have so much stuff that is still good content that actually isn't in either document, well, either season of the documentary. Yeah, it's like it's like chipping away at a block of ice, a massive block of ice, isn't it? We started the edit with post production on this series in December, you know, so it's quite a long way out. Um, mm. So you know, you're 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 constantly then looking at footage, making decisions. You've got to be flexible. You've got to change as you know, and things change always in the last sort of home straight of the edit. Um, but I think that you know, sometimes if you're complete in the way that you're viewing everything and and you know, like our post-production team was just incredibly sort of forensic, um, as was Tom, the series director. So that when you come to those conversations, I don't know, in like April when you're or May when you're very close to finishing, and it's like, well, this isn't quite working because we're missing a bit of it. They've got it in their heads that well, I remember seeing something where there was this occurred, and that might be able yeah. to slot in. And so you know, everybody just sort of from December, as I say, I use the word forensic, but was just dedicated in knowing the footage inside out and yeah there are things that you miss um and there's things that you don't miss uh, to be honest when you when you sort of put it all out and you finish it you you do you do forget what you cut out a lot of the time <laughs> you know you, you, there's no space in the in, in your head for it anymore 
yeah, no space in the head and no space on the hard drives, I would imagine as well, with the amount of stuff you've got if you've if you've been there day to day. Absolutely. Obviously, this the se- the series itself is quite jam-packed, as you've said, relegation, company leaving. We've got all the bits about scouting and and things like that, as I've mentioned. What what's your favorite part of, of season two? Oh man, that's a really good question. Um I like the I think actually I don't know episode three has some very interesting moments to it yeah. um, and aside from the the argument with Lyle and Jack or the, the, the discussion um, <laughs> I just think that the way that it really starts to unravel I'm quite proud of the way that we did that in a way that wasn't disrespectful I, I, I felt it wasn't disrespectful to the club about the way that things were just going sort of a bit awry. Now you might argue differently. You, your heart is much closer to the subject matter. Um, and I, but I also, one of my favorite bits is actually in, in episode four, when the results start turning around because geez, you yeah. know, you've spent such a long time in this show where, and in reality in the series where things just were pretty turgid. And then like you have this moment of elevation. I think that's, that's, um, that's a nice sequence. Um, but probably the, the 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 hardest sequence to put together, and the one I think that we should feel, I, I hope audiences respond to, is the Lyle Foster story. That yeah. was a really really tough nut to crack, and you don't really know whether you're doing it the right way or not sometimes because it's so delicate, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, even uh, swear, obviously we're incredibly small fry, uh, small fry on the podcast compared to you guys. But even when we're discussing it, we feel that like we don't want to overstep a mark or, or or say the wrong things. But I do feel like you did that quite well. And what I found interesting is about about the Lyle thing is obviously we didn't know until later on in the season. But you guys were mentioning it in episode one, and uh, obviously there were discussions about it the previous season and stuff like that. So I think it shines a light on it more about Lyle struggles, which I guess is it is good. And then it goes on, obviously, to show the stuff that we already knew about. So I, I do think it's done quite well. I, I do think that the Lyle thing's done quite well. And then it, it goes full circle as well with him arguing with or having the discussion, as, as you politically put it, with, with Jack to showing that he actually does care. Not that he ever didn't, but it's showing that he does cares. And I think it's done very well. I think it shows that he struggles, then he comes out the other side of it, and then he, and then he's showing that he cares personally. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you, you feel a responsibility ultimately when, when you, you're making a project like this because, you know, somebody's, um, you, you know, something very personal is being released into the public domain. And just, I, I did go and talk to Lyle before the series came out and spoke to him about, you know, how he's how it's been positioned and, and, you know, just to ensure that he's comfortable with it. And my fear was that football being football, there would be a pile on in a kind of rather toxic sense because mm. we know how football works and people just people look at them as guys with a lot of money. And it's an easy kind of target in that sense. They don't really get it. But I think people still don't really understand depression and mental health issues. And that's not a criticism. It's just so difficult to understand. And then, you know, it's an easy target, isn't it, for football uh, fans? But from what I've read so far and seen, I think people are very empathetic towards Lal. And he really deserves that because he's been really honest there and really brave. Yeah. And... Um, like I, I couldn't, I can't speak highly enough of the guy for for the, I don't want to swear, but the the you know like the balls he's got on him to sort of allow that to be shown to the public and to say yeah this is me this is who I am, you know and then as you say the the the, the dressing room scene with Jack, like he's got it in him to to show the balls there as well to say what he feels it needs to be said. You could argue whether it should have been said or not. It's irrelevant. You know this is a guy that 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 didn't just want to sit down and just what let things pass by. He wanted to, to, to say something. And I, I think he's an extraordinary character. He's a real like jewel for you guys. He's a, he's a very fine striker as well, as you know. So, you know, I, I hope you can hold on to him. I really do. And I think the environment of Burnley is good for him as well. You know, I, yeah. I think it's a good club for him. People care a lot. Yeah, I think we've shown last season that we can handle it very well. And even now with the change of management, obviously it's it's the club that handled it well, as well as Vincent. Vincent handled it quite well as well. But I think the club can handle it well. He handled it extremely well. He was extremely um, uh, understanding 
And like football never came into it with the way Vincent dealt with it, which was absolutely mm. perfect. And in fact, the only time football did come into it was when Vincent knew that that was where Lyle could probably feel happy again. So he timed it beautifully. And um, he was he was magnificent with Lyle, actually, Vincent. A lot of credit goes to him. Yeah, that obviously brings us perfectly onto that subject then, Vincent Company. Obviously, the scene where he, he leaves and there's the scene where Alan is fighting back tears, where he's talking to uh, a, a group of uh, what I believe is school children or, or, or church. I don't know what it is, but it, in the hospitality yeah. suite, Alan is actually fighting back tears. And I found that quite emotional. And the scene where he's still trying to organise dinner with Vincent, despite him sort of like saying he already wants to go and then cancelling it. it. It almost felt like, kind of like, you know, like uh, say like if an ex has walked away and you're trying your best to, to sort of like keep them and still be friends, that's kind of what it felt like. But what's what was he like then behind the scenes, Vincent, when when and Alan, um, when all of this was going on, the, the Bayern Munich stuff? Well, we didn't, we didn't see Vincent ourselves. You know, once the, the last game of the season ended, you know, we didn't see him. Obviously, the news emerged very quickly off the back of that about this interest from Bayern Munich. Um, so we followed that story on the ground level through Alan and, and Matt Williams, who was brilliant with us as well, by the way. Um, and uh, and Lee as well, to a point, you know, and, and, and then the board and how they were sort of dealing with it. But it was very much Alan, obviously. You know, it, it was it was really painful for Alan during that period. Yeah. And okay. again, like, you know, like, you know, people could say, well, it, it's sort of this or it's that. But the guy was was open about his feelings and you can't really ask for more than that sometimes. And like he he had invested a lot in Vincent, you know, from a sort of emotional point of view, you could argue. And it, he wasn't expecting this to happen. And it was it was tough on him. It was really tough on him. And then obviously he had to deal with Bayern Munich themselves, who were, you know, that was a complicated <laughs> Uh, episode, shall we say, you know, with Bayern Munich, but they got there in the end and, and he got a really good deal for Burnley. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, the, the add-ons that Burnley get are, are extraordinary, you know, Vincent wins this, Vincent wins that. So, you know, Alan got a good deal there. Um, and I saw him during that week change, you know, I'd say over a three-day period, he was he was pretty cut up on day one. Yeah, he was trying to get things done on day two, and by day three, he was he was pretty sort of focused on where to go next. So he had to go through a process, like we all do in those situations, I guess. Yeah, this is the best bit about mission to Burnley for me. Being a fan, obviously, like you said earlier, my heart's very much invested in the football club and things that happen. But it's just great to see it from that perspective. Obviously, I know you've done things with QPR in the past and and the uh, uh, Lions rugby team as well. So you'll be kind of used to these sort of things now. But uh, as a fan, it, it's great to see, even hearing that, that Alan was emotional, even though I've watched it myself and I know he was. Uh, you could see it was. But it's great to see that he cares because he still gets a lot of stick off certain sections of the fan base. But you can clearly see that he cares, can't you? Oh, I mean, he's a workaholic. You know, you don't, you're not, you, you, you don't, you don't put so much time and effort into uh you know an enterprise like this if you're if you don't care enormously and you know you people could throw back at me but money is a motivational no I, i've seen him take calls from upset staff from the club shop and sit down and talk to them for half an hour not just send somebody else in to do it you know yeah like you don't need to do that I don't, you know uh, when you're at that level of a club so you know he's so entwined in the fabric of the football club to try and do everything he can on an individual basis that then, you know, sort of like uh, has a wider sort of influence to, to the club. And, you know, he, he, he'll make mistakes. He'll do things that fans don't like, but you, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't question his, his, um, his attachment to the club. I think that's, that's totally true. Yeah. Completely agree with that one. Uh, we've obviously skirted past it already. You mentioned um, the, in fact, I'm not sure we did actually, but uh, the, training ground argument between company and Johan Berg Goodmanson. Um, is, is that the sort of thing that you see often in these? Because I'm surprised. That's actually gone viral, that clip, as I'm sure you've seen. Yeah. Um, but um, is this? it seems like this is something that happens a lot in the 90s and the early 2000s, probably not so much these days. And I was surprised to see company 
acting like that. I thought if anybody was going to be at the football club like that, it would be Craig Bellamy and sort of like good cop, bad cop sort of thing. So was that, like you said, I think that's in episode three and you did you did skirt past it briefly when you mentioned that's kind of like when it's all starting to unravel as well. Was that a regular occurrence with company or was that just company just completely losing it and it's not something that he did regular at, at the club? Well, I think firstly, like these things do happen at football clubs. I, I'm not going to say regularly, but every now and then, every now and then. And, and <laughs> the fact the clip went viral has really surprised me because I, I thought it was like a you know an interesting scene, and it's quite yeah. revealing in one sense. But I never sort of saw it as like headline news, and you know I've seen that it's been picked up by all the newspapers and they talk about it a lot on the radio. It, it, it generates a conversation, I guess. But I, I'm surprised to be honest that it's such a big deal. Um, but I, I'm aware that it's kind of interesting and it's kind of juicy from that point of view. These things do happen a lot. At Burnley, you know, flashpoints would happen every now and again. But there's, let's try and get this into context because that clip is taken totally out of context. And that's fine. It does what it does. But you're talking about nine months of filming every single day at a ground, mm. at a training pitch where there's, you know, 50, 60 men who have all got different things going on, who are all acting very differently. And... You know, if 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 one day someone irritates somebody and, you know, there's a reaction, I, I can't think of many of us who haven't had a reaction to something during a nine-month period if we're under such, you know, pressure. And we've all got different pressures, but let's just focus on Vincent's pressure. Premier League, spotlight, every single day, every single week, things are not going well. You know, it's, it's going to boil over every now and again. I, I, I don't think it, it's it, it's particularly nice or pleasant, but it, it's pretty normal, I would suggest. And look, he did it with Yoey. Yoey's a uh, a senior player. Yeah, strong character. He's a very strong character. And I'm not saying that he de he deserved it or didn't. You know, but it would have been way more uncomfortable if it was somebody a bit more junior. Um, it's probably not right, but it happens. And you saw with the argument with Lyle and um, Jack, things happen. Yeah, tensions boil over. Jack's got no issue with Lyle and Lyle's got no issue with Jack. It just It's just an occurrence in that moment. So I don't yeah. think, I've never thought Vincent had an issue with Joey personally. Now, I don't know, but I never saw it in that way. It's just an, a flashpoint that occurred. Everybody sort of like dusted themselves down and moved on. And that happens a lot in football from what I've seen. Yeah, well, even Sunday League level, which is the best I got to. Um, <laughs> I, I did see it happen quite a lot back in the day, but obviously the it, the famous hair dry treatment from Alex Ferguson and stuff, it's just you just don't tend to hear about it as much these days. But I, I, I am the same as you. I'm surprised it, it went so far. The same with the Jack Cork and Lyle Foster clip. Like, I, I did see somebody put a post up saying, oh, I'm still a big fan of Jack Cork despite this. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, he didn't do anything wrong. Like, he just said, show oh, some respect, no, Fuzzy, and stuff. Yeah, that one, that's a really interesting scene because when I first saw it, I mean, I was I was like, this is incredible. But I never once thought one was right and one was wrong. I both, I, I, my first initial response, I remember it was like, they're both right here. You know what yeah. I mean? They're both right. I agree with that. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's come across like, you, you can't take sides in that. It's like, Jack does what he needs to do because he's a club captain. And Lyle does what he needs to do because he cares in, in, enormously about the club. And it was it was a bleak day that, if you recall, Bournemouth. It was just a horrible, horrible performance, and, mm -hmm. and someone needed to say something. You could you could say so. Yeah, they both said their thing. The fact that they went at each other is actually really. It's just they're representing something bigger, aren't they? Ultimately, it's not about the individuals that. And they yeah. definitely, definitely never had a falling out. Yeah, well, it's interesting with that scene because on that scene, it, it does show them sort of like being mates again, literally within the next clip at training the day after or a couple of days after. That, that sort of stuff happens a lot, I do think, where a couple of players and stuff will have a debate, argument, and then they just make, they just shake hands again. Like you do it yourself in the pub sort of thing half the time with your mates when you're falling out about something on, you know, on when you're watching the footy. And it happens all the time. So that, that was good to see. Uh, and another one that got quite a lot of uh, chatter and debate, only really in the Burnley fan base is Drumgate. Obviously, the scene where 
Um, I think it's, is it Russell talking to um, yeah. a couple of staff members at the club about the drum? Sort of like criticising the atmosphere and criticising the fans. Good work with the tweets. The tweets worked on that one as well, I think, where the fans were sort of like against it, showing the fan feeling. What are your thoughts on, on the entire sort of like drum gate situation? Like before I'd let you answer, I do quite like the, the scene where he's sort of like trying to unpack the drum and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see where that would be now, obviously, because it never saw the light of day uh, on, on the ground. But uh, yeah, what were your thoughts on, on sort of like the drum gate situation? Well, I think that, again, you know, Alan, what he's trying to do is be proactive. He's, he's trying to, to look at something that he feels is an issue and do something about it. Now, I, like, I, I completely agree with fans who will say, well, just pick up some results on the pitch and everything will change. But he wasn't able to do anything about that. So he was looking at other angles on it. I don't think that people really want a drum. You know, let's be honest. Um, I think that Alan was doing a slight sort of agitating role. You know, like you see, you see this a lot. You know, it's like if you can be, if you can agitate and you don't really care about how people view you, but because it might be for the greater good of something, then you'll sort of do that. And I think Alan was slightly playing that role. And I think mm. he wanted to get a conversation going. And he knew that if he was to do something quite controversial as a notion, then you know, it would get the conversation going and make people think perhaps differently. I think Russell, <laughs> Russell, bless him, had to go and follow through these these instructions. And, um, you know, that was a tough gig for Russell because, you know, he, he, he you know, it, it was going to fall pretty flat on, on, on its face. Let's face it. And the fans were going to revolt against it. But, uh, but Russell had to sort of carry, carry through the instructions. Um, but ultimately, I guess what it did do was it did, it did sort of, it put the issue in a spotlight, you know, with the fans and maybe made people think about things in one or two different ways. I don't think Alan was ever absolutely beholden to having a drum. I think he just wanted to create something to get people thinking about what could we do about the atmosphere a bit more. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it is obvious, isn't it? Like, you, if you can just pick up some wins, then everything changes. Yeah, I think as a fan, that, that is sort of like your your ideology. It's like, well, if you want the atmosphere to be better, start winning some games. Like the amount of times that we went to the turf, again, speaking as a fan, last season, where you're 1-0 down within five minutes. And I remember yeah. that Man City match, obviously the first day of the season, we were buzzing, the atmosphere were good. And then we are 1-0 down so early on, it just killed the atmosphere straight away. Yeah. Same on to Villa. It happened so many times. Even the Newcastle game later in the season, I remember thinking, wow, this atmosphere is really good. It's really loud. And then as soon as they score... Backs, you know, shoulders slumped. Everybody's just in a mood. I just feel like, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. I feel like it. Obviously, they look at it from a different perspective. I get that, but from a fan perspective, it is just a case of win some games. Then, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, obviously, I've mentioned the two argument scenes as well. I think this is the Lyle one and the or the Jack one uh, uh, and the Jack one. I can't remember. <laughs> but was there any moments where because there's a scene on the third show i think it is i've only i've only been able to watch it once um because i had to get it on now tv um and it ran out after 24 hours um but there's a scene when they're arguing that you can tell the camera person feels a little bit awkward and sort of like moves away and you can see them moving away is there any sort of like moments where obviously you've mentioned james and and and, and your other camera person that that's obviously there quite a lot is there any moments where they're thinking this is a bit awkward this you should probably stop filming or is it just just film everything yeah no there's def there's definitely i mean yeah there's definitely moments when they would have felt awkward i think that the that that particular argument you know jack and lyle he he, he i think he might have even got a tap on the shoulder you know that's why he started to retreat um yeah you know i, I think the thing is from those guys point of view that that's that's a really tough job for them because they've imagine, got yeah. to, They've got to get in places to get the footage, but they've also got to, you know, footballers are pretty intense sometimes as a pack and, and you want to keep them on side and you don't want to be seen as though you're doing something sort of duplicitous or sort of just to get juicy stuff at their expense. So um, there would be moments when they would have made the call like, look, I'll get a bit of this and then I'll get out for the sake of the relationship again. Um, but I think I don't think they ever... The, uh, the players on the whole were really good with them. Yeah. And I remember there was, I think there was one occasion 
when one of the players went like, oh, you know, like we're losing all the time. We've got, you know, cameras following us. And I think it was Jay Rodriguez that said, this wasn't on camera, uh, said, like pointed at the camera, James, the cameraman, and said, look, it's not his fault that we're losing games. You know what I mean? So I think that was the only time when someone really sort of directly in front of the group referred to the cameras. And that was a bit awkward. But J-Rod totally shot it down and in a very sort of mature and, and you know, with leadership, should we say. Yeah. I'm not surprised to hear that J-Rod was the one taking leadership there. Um, obviously, there's the dynamics change a little bit now at the club. Um, was there any situations that this Vincent Company um, and Johan Berg Gudmundsson argument, for example, is there any instances where the club have sort of like said, ah, that's a bit much that, do you, do you, would you mind if you take that out? Or has it always just been a case of, yep, yeah, you can do whatever you want sort of thing? Or have they ever turned around and said, no, that's that's a bit much that, we, we, we don't want that in the documentary, for example? You know, there's, I've, I've gone on a couple of message boards over the last week you know, just out of curiosity to see what they're saying. About it. And the one thing that absolutely drives me mad is when people th say things as though they're in the know about how Sky have, have, have handled this, you know, like whether they just decide what they're going to put in and how the club have got, you know, authority over us. Like we are an mm. independent production company and we've gone into this with an agreement. I have a very good relationship with Alan where he trusts me and he, he does not, He's never told me you can't put that in or you don't put that in unless it's a legal issue. Yeah. Now, so, so Alan gets sent certain clips and scenes that I feel might be legally contentious for the club. And that's absolutely what we have to do. You know, my lawyers tell me we have to do that and his lawyers tell me we have to do that. But, there, you know, it's this going back to the point about what I read in these message boards is like, you really think if Alan had so much control over this and this was a propaganda piece, he would allow half the stuff we've seen of him, where he's tearful. Mm. Where he's, you know, he's sort of said things that fans are poking fun at about Eric Dyer and things like that. Like, like he's truthful and honest and said, you know, like, you, you, you show me in my truth, warts and all, and whether people sort of see this as this or that as that, at least I'm being truthful and honest. And, and, and that's, that's the bottom line here. It is, it, we have had editorial control throughout, and we've had trust from Alan, and apart from the legal side of things, you know, that's the only only time he can kind of sort of tell us to put things, take things out. Yeah, no, that's obviously completely understandable. Um, I know you're on holiday, so I don't want to keep you for too long. I think half an hour's quite a good sort of like length for this sort of thing. But obviously, I've got to ask you as well. Season three, filming started. What are the yeah. what are the plans for season three? Can we expect one, or is it kind of one of them things where? The cameras are there at the minute. We're picking stuff up because obviously we saw the, the ending of, of season four, Scott Parker sort of like rocking up and stuff like that. So you obviously were there for that. Are the cameras kind of there at the minute? And it's just a case of we'll film it and then hopefully we'll get signed off for a season three later in the year and then we can announce it probably sometime next year. I, I'm not sure. I mean, firstly, at the end of season two, we got this incredible story with Vincent leaving. Hmm. Um, and then... We kept rolling. We, 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 we planned to finish filming quite quickly after the season ended, but obviously everything occurred. And then we kept rolling even more because they were looking for a new manager. And we got some extraordinary footage in that. And I often think if we do go to season three, maybe we can sort of like rewind a little bit to that because there's some good stuff there that we just yeah. we couldn't get into season two. And, and we wanted to tie it up quickly. We didn't want it to suddenly have a new direction of like, oh, we're looking for, you know, it's just like epilogue it quickly. Um, so, you know, if we do see the season, season, that's one one of the, the sort of ideas I've been toying with in my head. But we filmed a little bit over the summer. Um, uh, I'm not so sure that pre-season is that interesting anyway. Um, and we're not in production at the moment. So you have to be realistic about, you know, your, your sort of bandwidth. Um, we filmed, um, you know, we filmed a little bit and, and build, building up to the looting game. And now we're sort of just, we're hands off. And we'll wait to see what conversations can occur with Sky and with Burnley themselves. Um, you know, it's a different dynamic now. You've got a new coach. Um, from my point of view, I, I, I would obviously be delighted to go, go again because I think we've built up such... The audience have built up such a familiarity now with the club and the character yeah. that it would be a waste, a shame, sorry, to, 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 to sort of like not continue with that. And I think that... 
you know, it's got good momentum now as a series, hasn't it? And it doesn't really matter whether you're in the Premier League or the Championship because the story is so interesting, isn't it? You know, behind the scenes at a club that's that's been so open from that point of view. So, yeah, I mean, watch this space. We'll we'll see what, like, as I say, we'll see what conversations occur. I guess if it rates well, then, you know, it's a better conversation with Sky. So yeah. I'm hoping that it rates well, but we'll see. Well, it's definitely rated well amongst Burnley fans. And I'll be honest, I was uh, on Twitter not long after the Luton game. And I think this guy put it on after the Luton game. I can't remember. And I, I just saw yeah. loads of fans. Yeah, I saw loads of fans of other clubs talking about it and talking about how good it was and stuff. So I think it will have rated well. But obviously, you'll know more on that side to me. I think it will be a shame. And you say then it, we don't need to be in the Premier League. Of course we don't. You, like you said, there's been a QPR one. I could, but you, they could have been in the Premier League at that point. I'm not sure. But obviously, there's been in the, the Sunderland one as well, all the way down to, to League one and stuff like that and that did very well so i, I would hope uh that yeah like you said there's a, fami a familiarity now with the with the players with the team so it, it would be a shame and I, I mean I, i'd watch it even if they're all the way down in league two of course i would but i, I think i think it'll still have um fans watching it of other clubs um so yeah fingers crossed there is a season three but like i said matt obviously i'm fully away on holiday i don't want to keep you too long i just want to say thank you again for coming on the show, especially when you're on a holiday. It's a pleasure. And thank you for working so hard on season one and season two, mate. Season two, I agree, it's it's fantastic. Season one, I think I think season one's probably the one I'll still be watching in 15 years. It's what like remind me of my favourite ever season. Whereas season two is good and it, it shows it from a different perspective, but it's it's a season that we don't want to remember. But Season one, for example, I'll, I'll be I'll be watching it. I think with my little boy in about ten years. But yeah, the ball, fantastic piece of work, mate. And you and the team should be very proud. I really appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure, honestly. And you know, I've always um, I always say it like you know, I'm not a Burnley fan. I'm a Sheffield Wednesday fan. But we, when you go into another club, you feel a bit dirty at first. You know, you're like, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like that about Burnley. I, I think it's I've got such affection for it. And if we don't go on to do a season three. I will, you know, I'll still head up to Turf Moor every now and again, I think, just to take in a game because it's, uh, you know, it's it's just such a great, fantastic club and, and, you know, it's one that you guys are obviously really proud of. So, good for you. Yeah, definitely. Well, if there is a season three, mate, I'm sure we'll see you on the podcast again next year. Obviously, for those that have been watching the show for a while, we'll remember Matt from an interview we did after the end of season one. So, fingers crossed we're doing it again in about a year, mate. But like I said, thank you for coming on the, on the show, mate. No, thanks for your time. Cheers.